What's the most common advice in politics? Probably learn from the past. Well, for once, leaders are listening. At last week's G20 summit, a new project was announced, a corridor between two continents, from Europe to West Asia to India. Historians were up immediately. They thought the route seemed familiar, and guess what? They were right. This route is almost as ancient as maritime trade. It created and bankrupted empires. It led to the intermingling of civilizations. It also forged modern Asia's history. At the center of it was one commodity, or rather one group of commodities, our good old spices. The route they traveled was called the Spice Route. If the Silk Route was over land, the Spice Route was over sea. India and its partners are trying to revive it to create a new Spice Route. It's an ambitious and symbolic plan, but like I said, it's important to learn from the past how the route was created, why spices, and how it all played out. Time for a flashback. Where do we begin? Around 4,000 years ago is a good time. No maps, no charts, no geography. This is a world shrouded in mystery and legends. This is the time when spices first came to West Asia. Arab traders found them. They were grown mostly in India and Southeast Asia. But trade did not explode immediately. For that, we have to wait another 2,000 years. Alexander the Great was marching through Europe and Asia. He set his eyes on India next. Now, invasions are messy affairs. But back then, they had an unintended consequence. Cultural exchange. When Alexander invaded, he brought Greek cuisine to India. And even today, it lingers. If you live in India, chances are you cook with fenugreek. Guess where it came from? Mediterranean Europe. Today, Europe barely produces fenugreek. India, on the other hand, is the biggest producer. If herbs came to India, spices went to Europe. Alexander carried hordes of saffron back home and thus began a love story, one that would shape history and empires. Until then, European food was mostly bland and boring. Spices up the game. They added flavor, they added preservatives, they also added some mystique. After all, you couldn't grow spices in Europe. You needed the tropical climate of Asia. Just one problem though, the Europeans did not know how to reach there. They had no clue where Asia was. But Arab traders did. They became the middlemen in the first spice route. Let's pull up the map. The route began from the west coast of Japan, from there to the spice islands of Indonesia, then to India and from India to West Asia. Now we reach the final leg of the journey. Arab traders would take spices across the Mediterranean to Europe. Job done. So the first spice route was a hybrid one. Some parts over sea and the rest over land. Europeans paid a fortune for these spices. They were considered a luxury in the early Roman Empire. Only the elites used spices. Also, the Arab traders had a few tricks up their sleeve. They knew that they had to protect their market, so they spread rumors and myths. For example, cassia, was supposed to grow in lakes guarded by winged creatures, a bit like bats. Cinnamon apparently grew in valleys infested by snakes. Pepper grew on an island guarded by dragons. Imagine hearing these stories 2,000 years ago. You would be scared too. And thus, Arab traders created a monopoly. They controlled the 15,000-kilometer-long spice route. How did that monopoly break? In 30 BC, the Romans took control of Egypt. They now had their own ports, the most important being the port of Alexandria. Suddenly, the equation changed. Europe did not need Arab traders anymore. They could sail to India themselves. As a result, the myths were busted. Pliny the Elder was one of the myth busters. He made fun of stories about snakes and dragons. He saw them for what they were, a tactic to drive up prices. The trade between India and Rome flourished over five centuries. Rome sold wine, glassware and olive oil to India. India sold spices and ivory to Rome. Many cities in southern India became massive trade hubs, like Muziris, which is called India's first emporium. We've done an entire episode on this ancient city. You can watch it here. India had the upper hand in this trade. We exported more than we imported. Still, it was a better deal for Rome. After all, they did not have to depend on the Arabs anymore. You can still find Roman coins in southern India. It is proof of this flourishing trade. But as they say, nothing lasts forever. By the 6th century, the trade collapsed. The Roman Empire was gone. New city-states and republics took its place, like Venice and Genoa. 
They continued to jostle over the spice route. Even fought a war in 1378, Venice ended up defeating Genoa. So now there was a new equation, a new spice route. Arab traders would import spices from India. They would then sell them to Venice, only Venice, because the Arabs had exclusive agreements with them. You can imagine how that worked. Imagine there is a single McDonald's in your city. What would happen? The whole town would go there because if you wanted McDonald's, there was only one option. For Europe, that option was Venice. If you wanted spices, you needed Venice. But even this equation did not last. By the end of the 15th century, European countries began to wonder, why are we going to the same cellar? Why not try the source? Thus began the age of discovery. Sailors set off in search of the legendary land of spices, India. In 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed under the Spanish flag. No luck. He ended up on American shores. In 1497, John Cabot sailed under the English flag. Again, no luck. Finally, it was the Portuguese who got lucky. Vasco da Gama made the first voyage from Europe to India. He arrived in 1498. And his route looked like this. All the way around the southernmost tip of Africa. Remember, there was no Suez Canal then. So to reach India, you had to take the long way. And that's what Vasco da Gama did. He sailed close to the African East Coast. So he ended up in Kenya. Once there, he met a Gujarati sailor, someone who knew the route to India. So the Portuguese took him along. After 23 days, the crew spotted India's Western Ghats. They landed here in the Malabar coast. And lucky for them, it was the center of the spice trade. Most Arab ships sailed from there. Portugal's arrival in India changed everything. The Arab traders lost their monopoly. Simply put, their game was up. There were no valleys with poisonous snakes. No islands guarded by dragons. India was very much real. Fresh from his success, Vasco da Gama returned to Portugal. Not empty-handed though. He took back lots of cinnamon and pepper. The Portuguese loved it. The king showered him with titles and riches. And after this, many Europeans followed. The Dutch, the English and the French. All of them came for spices, but soon they discovered that India had a lot more to offer. I think the rest is well documented. Colonialism, exploitation, and then freedom. At the center of all of this was the spice route. Goods, ideas, and religions traveled via this route. It was never constant. It kept evolving over time. The old spice route put India on the map, but the rest was not so pleasant. The new spice route features a new India, one that has learned from the past and is excited about the future.